The ring, please. The ring, the ring please. Please, please. Don't keep Don't me waiting, waiting, Dan. Not any longer, please. The ring. Don't keep me waiting, Dan. Not any longer, please. Don't keep me waiting, Dan. Not any longer, please. Don't keep me waiting, Dan. No! Scalpel. I want the scalpel. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Hear me? I want the scalpel. Scalpel. Scalpel! I want the scalpel! I want the scalpel! I fell asleep. I'm sorry. Don't look frightened. I'm, I'm all right. I'll check the fire. No, don't bother. I have an idea of the fires. Sleep. In a few minutes. Well, I know Emily will see to it that I get up in the morning, so I'm going to say goodnight to you. Would you like me to stir the fire? No, no, no. That's all right. I can do it. Not too late now. I'm fine. <laughs> Good night, Peggy. Good night. And thanks. Moments of happiness, valleys of despair and doubt. We'll return to As the World Turns in just a moment. Today, let's make chicken noodle soup with tender chicken. Well, sooner or later, Berta, you will have. The attorney and the defendant apparently fell in love during the murder trial. They make it sound sordid. You know, I have half a mind to call up the editor of this newspaper and... Of course, that's what Steve Jackson was so afraid of. Just what's happened that the newspapers would get hold of it and they'd blow it all up and they'd drag Leslie into it. Oh, Michael. You seen the paper? Yes, I saw it just now. Are you going to the hospital alone, Elizabeth? Well, I'm going to meet Ellen and Nancy there. Bye, bye, bye. I'll phone you when it's all over. I was a new bride. My floors didn't need top job. But they do now. My family puts down lots of dirt. Top jobs of floor... He's quite lucid. He's a little groggy after all. He was in surgery for quite a while. He asked to see his brother. Oh, well, Dan left the hospital. He had an important appointment. I'll tell him. I'll keep in touch with you, David. Yeah, I want to see you later. Of course.
Well, son, heard the good news, didn't you? Hi, Dad. Yeah, I heard. And it is good news. Dan and I were in surgery. We waited until the biopsy report came in. And then we went out and we told your mother, and Elizabeth, and Nancy that they could all go home. I told you you were a great guy. <laughs> I want to see Dan. Paul. He was in to see you, but you were asleep. He had a very important appointment. Patient? I don't know. He didn't say. Now, you're still sleepy, so I won't be in anymore tonight. I'm going on home now. Believe me, I feel a lot better now than I did this morning. Have a good night, son. Okay, Dad, I will. my chart. Well, there's no reason why you can't see it, Dr. Stewart. But why don't you wait until the anesthetic completely wears off? No reason I can't see it. I wonder... as the world turns in just a moment. There are times when... Mom, what you just said, you're telling me that you don't, you don't want to live with a woman. You want to marry a woman. Precisely. <laughs> well, Dr. Baxter, this is so sudden. Well, not at all. I think you just jumped to a sudden conclusion. I... I don't recall having proposed marriage. Well, not in so many words, no. Well, not in any words of any kind. For a very logical reason, too. Well, I'm not sure I want to know the reason. How about hearing me out, and then we'll see. Because I get the feeling that you're not ready to admit that your present marriage isn't working. I have a husband. I have a lovely child. But what does all that prove? I mean, you don't even want to tell Dan why I don't know that we're going to have dinner together tonight. You're pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Yes. Because the same thing is going on inside me that's going on inside you. Telling us in a hundred different ways that... that we not only have fun working together, we have fun... Just having fun together. I mean, eating, drinking, talking. Just being together. And you are more attractive than any... You see, if I'd met you first, or certainly if I were in Dan's place Let's right now, I'd... Just leave Dan out of this. I'm willing to leave Dan out of it, but are you? Now, 
it roll off your fingertips like this. You take the whites, I'll take the colors. What are you doing? The laundry. Yeah, Mom, want to be permanent press? <laughs> Willis, I'll do the laundry when I get back. Nope, you shop, I'll wash. Willis, that's my favorite blouse. If it fades Hey, come on, it's all here on the box. Different clothes, different temperatures. You read the chair? Three temperatures, one detergent. Bright, fadeable colors, cold water, acrylics and permanent press, warm, and that's a foul shot. Whites in hot, all temperature cheer. We know. Bye. Hey, you have to see this. Look at these colors. Acrylics and permanent press, beautiful. And remember this, that's clean. That cheer really does a great job. Cheer? What about us? Oh, thanks. Now, why don't you go outside and play laundry? All temperature cheer. For the way you wash now, all temperature. The first portion of this program has been brought to you today by All Temperature Cheer. All Temperature. We'll continue with As the World Turns, following station identification. The Steinbergs had an audience with the Pope, which doesn't sit too well with the Fitzgeralds on Bridget Loves Bernie tomorrow on CBS. A bunch of regular people like you and me sing the Diet Right Cola song. Watch. People who don't need it, drink it. Folks not on a diet to riot. Everybody likes it. Diet Right Cola. Everybody likes it. Diet Right Cola. Everybody likes it. And you know why? Does it taste so good? <laughs> you don't have to give up good taste to save on calories. Diet Right Cola tastes so good, everybody likes it. Tucker Power, Monday morning. And now the second portion of As the World Turns. It's a new rule, Mrs. Stewart. Emily has to be in her room, in her playpen, along with her toys, for one hour every day. So much of our lives are spent alone. I think it's a good idea to learn how to live with ourselves. I never thought of it that way. But alone in her room? <sighs> I don't think anybody has to feel sorry for Emily Stewart. If you were to peek in there right now, you'd find her very involved with her, her blocks or her stuffed animals, even her picture books. <laughs> she loves the bright colors. Besides, I think we all need a vacation from people now and again. <laughs> of course, the highlight every day is still just before bedtime, when her daddy reads her a story. Of sorts. You know, he points at the pictures and he, he tells her things about them. And I imagine her mother reads her a story of sorts, too? Well, yes, and, um, and very often she'll, she'll try to hurry home from work at noon so that she can have lunch with her. She can't do that too often, but... She makes the effort. Well, I'm glad to hear that. She should be home soon, shouldn't she? Well, no, no, I, I don't expect Mrs. Stewart home early this evening. She, um, she said that she wouldn't be home for dinner. Perhaps I shouldn't plan to stay. Oh, no, Mrs. Stewart, I, I know the doctor would love to have you stay for dinner. He, he so seldom gets the chance to... <laughs> Besides, we, we have a surprise for you. Emily now joins her father at the dinner table. She sits there in her high chair like a little queen. You don't feed her there, do you? Oh, no. No, she could never hold out till her daddy's dinner time. But at least she's made aware that she's a member of the family. That was her son's idea. And when Susan's not home, it's... Does Emily and her father at the table? Well, no, no. Dr. Stewart insists that I should be there, too. Well, that's as it should be. I'm not so sure, Mrs. Stewart. I, I hate to have Emily turn to me for everything. I, we've talked about this before. I, I'd like to leave. But whenever I think about leaving Emily, I... Well, Mom! Hello, oh, great to see you. Hi, Peggy. Hello, Dr. Stewart. Mwah. Mrs. Stewart is going to be joining us for dinner this evening. Yes, Mrs. Stewart. Mm -hmm. Is it all right, dear? It's perfect. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go look in on my little girl. 
You're very lucky, Dan. It's not often you find someone like Peggy Regan to look after your child. And in many ways, you're home. Yes, uh, Susan thinks she's a miracle. I imagine so. Did you know that she, Susan, won't be home for dinner this evening? Uh, yes. She's having dinner with, uh, Dr. Baxter. We'll return to As the World Turns in just a moment. Here's a ridiculous idea. Hiding Christmas presents in September. You know how I feel? Wonderful. Now, look, Mom, I finally reached the point where, uh, I don't pay any attention to rumors. Baxter's a uh, fine guy. He really is. Do you know him that well? Fairly well. He and Susan make a great team. In fact, that experiment they're working on now might someday turn into something big. You sound very casual about it. So is my wife. And you're perfectly agreeable to her working full time. Uh, there are lots of answers to that one. How about a glass of sherry? Love one. How about giving me just one good answer to my question? Susan's a real pro. She's serious, hardworking, and she never lets the fact that she's a woman get in her way for one minute. Mom, she's up there with the best of them. What, what more can I say? Is she as good as her teammate? Every bit. You know, in some respects, even better. Well, you know how long she's been in love with research. She's thoroughly prepared. Technique and attitude. She deserves a chance to put all of that to work. Now, if I can do what I love every day, why, why can't she? And perhaps the problem and the mistake was in having a child. No. No. Emily's... Emily's my girl. Just as... Just as Betsy is, uh, Paul's. Betsy was once your girl, in her mind. You're still very fond of her, aren't you? Of course I am. She's bright, she's sweet, she's... She's a real heartbreaker. She's got it all, Mom. Paul told me that she's been promoted to first grade. Whatever happened to kindergarten? Well, the school thought she was beyond that. You know, I bet they're right. Say, how is Paul? I only see him every now and then. How are you two getting along? Just as though we never had an argument between us. But, you know, I think he's... He's got some trouble with his eyes. Do you think it's really his eyes? Why? Have you noticed something else? It's just that for some reason he feels his whole family has let him down. Well, maybe in a way we all have. From what Liz has said, I gather that, who knows, maybe someday. You can't possibly believe that those two will remarry. I think Paul thinks they will. After all, it didn't take him long to went over Betsy. So it seems. So it is. Dan, I don't mean to change the subject, but I'm still very puzzled by your attitude. Yes, about Susan and Dr. Baxter. Mom, Susan and I understand each other. We've come to the conclusion that there's no reason she can't go her own way, and, and I go mine. And Emily? Oh, Dan, that's not right. I know I've been through it. I grew up in a home where, where there was no love between a mother and a father. I grew up loving both of them and being torn apart when they were divorced. Look, I'm, I'm not thinking of leaving Susan. All right, there was a time... But that's past. We're gonna stay a family. And don't forget, I've... I've been through a few things myself. Oh, I know. And somehow it all comes back to me. Now, how could you possibly think that? I don't think it. I know it. We'll return to As the World Turns in just a moment. Bobby's teacher. Oh? 
She's coming right over with work he missed. She's what? Help pick up this mess. I'll dust with pledge. It smells great. Like fresh lemons. It's lemon pledge. Cleans great, too. And fast. Hey, a real wax shine. You know, she'll think you've been waxing all day. With lemon pledge, all I did was dust. Oh, it's beautiful. Hey, beautiful. <laughs> Wanna answer the door? Uh, pledge, lemon or regular. It will be a meal, like any meal. Then, the country fresh flavor of parquet will shatter every thought you ever had about margarine. Country fresh flavor. Taste what it brings to fried foods. Taste it on hot biscuits. Clean, delicate. Parquet with the country fresh flavor that'll shatter every thought you ever had about margarine. That's the parquet taste, the country fresh flavor from Kraft. I don't know much about art. But? You know, you what, know you what you like. like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that. Well, I only wish it were an original. But even that print was more than any struggling young research man had a right to pay. Struggling young research man? Just look at this marvelous apartment, the, the, the furniture, the pictures. I guess you had to find an apartment just to fit it all in. Oh, not quite. I had no idea you were so well set up. That's why I asked you after dinner to stop by. <laughs> Seriously, why did you rent such an enormous apartment? Well, I figured a larger apartment wasn't going to be that much more expensive than a small apartment plus furniture storage, and, uh, I don't know, I don't like the feeling of being hemmed in or pushed into a corner. Except maybe in the corner of a laboratory. <laughs> there, I'm pretty happy. Well, sit down, won't you? You're a pretty contradictory character. Are you aware of that? Contradictory? Oh, now that shoe is on your foot, not mine. <laughs> yeah, how about something to drink? No, I, I don't want to drink. Do you know something? That could be considered a leading remark. Oh? Leading where, Dr. Baxter? Who knows, Dr. Stewart? Let's find out. Pillsbury introduces Bundt Cakes. Fancy cakes made easy. What's that ring of macaroon? Now you see it. Now you don't. But slice the Bundt Cake and there's the macaroon inside. Chocolate macaroon is one of three new Bundt brand cakes from Pillsbury. Cake, filling, and glaze mix all in one box. So you don't have to be a fancy baker to bake a fancy cake. New Bundt Cakes from Pillsbury. Say hello, say hello. Say hello to the no-box cookie from Pillsbury. Pillsbury's cookies don't come in a box because you can't box in this much flavor, this much freshness. Pillsbury chocolate chip cookies come fresh from the dairy case. You serve them hot from the oven, and hot from the oven beats cold from the box any day. Reach for the no-box cookie from Pillsbury. Dated for freshness in the dairy case. <laughs> furnished by Jeunesse. And now be sure to stay tuned for The Guiding Light, immediately following as the world turns next over most of these CBS stations. This is Dan McCullough inviting you to join us again of God's invitation. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance.
and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Did you see it? Read it for me. Want to go. Okay, let me read to you in a newer version, like the NIV, several others who say the same thing. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance. The ends of the earth, your possession. He says, ask, and I'll give you the nations. When are you going to ask? He says, I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. It's time to lay claims. In every field. Doesn't matter where you function. In every field, you can ask. He says, ask and I'll do it. So what do you do? You ask. And you don't say, okay, I'm going to wait until God does it. No. When you ask, you receive because he already gave you the word. There's not going to be no. You understand? He's not going to say, I'll think about it. No, he says, ask, and it's done. So be bold to ask. Take, take the limits off. And be bold. And say, this cell we are moving from 15 to 400. And when we get to 400, that's 400 strong. 400, 400. That's a whole lot of workers. That means we can go for 4,000. In the same way that you put your faith to work for your finances, you put your faith to work for souls. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I receive 200 new people into this fellowship. 200 new people. And when you say that and you receive in the name of Jesus, then he'll give you visions, ideas on how to get there. You go to work. You go to work. The grace has been made available. If we didn't have the grace for it, we shouldn't be talking about it. What we do. Hallelujah. We do. And it's working. Working. It's working, producing results. I receive. Hallelujah. I'm not sure the many pastors who realize that they could do that every month. You can determine how many people are going to come to church next month. And you set your goal, set that vision before you, and decide. And of course, you, don't, you, you work with your level of faith, what your faith is being raised for. You don't just stand there. I mean, if you're ready, you, you can't stand there. You know you've got 1,000 members. And then you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, next Sunday, next Sunday, 40,000. God will say, if I give you 40,000, you're not ready for that. Why? Because you need workers. You need to train people for it. He's ready, but you need to train people for it. you got to train people for it. The Holy Spirit is the one that does it. Remember when the children of Israel asked for meat in the Old Testament. They said, we're tired of this manna. Every day, manna, manna, manna. And you know the meaning of manna. It means, what is this? <laughs> so they said, we're fed up. They said, Moses, we want real meat. And Moses said, you're so many. How can you expect God to give you meat? Do you expect God to kill all the beasts of the field? Hey, come on. 
Don't ask for that. And they said, if he's God, he'll give us meat. We want meat. <laughs> so they so troubled Moses. The Bible says they went and stood at their, at their doors, the tent doors. All the men stood at their tent doors, weeping and mourning. Oh, the onions and the garlic that we had in Egypt. We ate meat in Egypt. Now all these years, manna, 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 manna. And the Bible says, God heard their cry. And he called Moses. He said, come. They're asking for meat. Moses said, don't mind them. <laughs> God said, no, I, I will mind them this time. I'm going to give them meat. Moses said, Lord, will you kill all the animals in the bush because of these people? He said, I don't have to do that. I will give them meat. Yeah. Moses was troubled. And when God saw that Moses couldn't believe, he said to him, is the Lord's hand shortened? Is there anything impossible with me? He said, you will see what I will do. He said, these guys are asking, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? He said, you will see it happen. Yeah. And finally, Moses started getting excited. God said, tell them to get ready. They will eat meat until it comes out of their nostrils. <laughs> and now, you know, Moses couldn't figure out what God was going to do, you know. And they were ready. And then the Bible says, oh, hallelujah. It says, God sent a strong wind. The same wind that went through the Red Sea. That's the Holy Ghost. It was the Holy Ghost who did it. The Bible says the wind, this wind of God, Brought quails. Quails are big birds. Brought quails all the way. These quails were flying to the camp of Israel. And when they got to the camp, they landed. And then they kept landing on the camp, landing and landing until the whole field was full and they were landing on each other. Heaps and heaps of birds. No space to touch. And they touched down on themselves. And the children of Israel came out and they carried birds and carried birds. There was no need to try to tie them in your house. No need to. I mean, it was everywhere. God said, you want meat. Now eat. <laughs> they had more than enough. So much to say about that. But the area I want you to notice is that the wind of God brought the quails to the right place. If he could bring the quails to the camp of Israel, he can bring the sinners to your fellowship. He'll bring them to your cell meeting. He'll bring them to the church services. Can you shout amen, somebody? You know, when I first studied this part of the Bible, I said, Lord, it's so easy. Now, next Sunday, I want, to, I want the quills. Bring the souls in next Sunday. The Lord said, no, it's not like that. So how? There are other things to put in place. You don't have everything else in place, do you? I thought, oh, what else do I need? So God, train people. These are souls. You don't want them to come and go away. You want to keep them. You have to train people. You have to have good plans. Oh, they're not just going to come for services. If you have 1,000 1, members, you have 1, 000, at least 1,000 problems. You see that? 
They don't just come. They come with their burdens, with their problems, with their challenges, with their anger, with their frustrations, with sicknesses and diseases, infirmities. They come with everything like that. Very few come with testimonies. <laughs> I mean, you pastors, you know, there are few people who come to see you and say, Pastor, I want to see you because I have some testimonies to share with you. There are few. Most others got problems. And, you know, after hearing all the problems, the kinds you never imagined existed, after hearing all, you go like this. <laughs> Except God keeps you straight. You fall out. Things you never imagined possible, now you're hearing them as a pastor. You go, oh. <laughs> but through the Spirit, you can do anything. Amen. You can handle anything. Amen. Hallelujah. So you've got to listen to the Holy Ghost. Listen to him. He's ready. He says, ask of me and I'll give you. Ask and I'll give you. Ask. Ask, 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 and I'll give you. He's ready. Are you ready? Thank you. Earlier on today, we're talking about some things, and we got to the book of Revelation. You remember? And I was explaining to you how that verse of Scripture got my attention years ago. He said, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15. Anybody whose name was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What is this book of life? The book of life is a book that God revealed to his servants, the prophets. Very early, in the history of the church. And when I say the church this time, I'm not just talking about in the New Testament. Right back in the Old Testament, Moses spoke of God's book in which was written the names of God's people. The prophets talked about that same book. He's always revealed that he has a book in which is written the names of those who belong to him. When does someone's name get in the book of life? I know there are those who say that when, when you're born again, God writes your name in the book. Well, Moses was not born again. How come his name was in the book? In the Bible, he doesn't talk about when he's going to write someone's name in the book, but he does talk about Taking someone's name out of the book. <laughs> and Moses, Moses implied that his name was in the book. Exodus 32, verse 32. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 32. Moses here was speaking to God. And he says, yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not... Read the rest. How could he blot him out if it's not already in there? Right? So Moses is telling us his name is in the book. And he knew his name was in the book. His name was there. So, and Moses was not born again. You say, why? I thought Moses was born again. No, no one could be born again until Jesus came. Jesus was the first to be born again. You say, oh, what about all those who came before Jesus? That means you don't know the meaning of being born again. Being born again is not an expression of turning over a new leaf. Being born again means that you have come out of death. That's what it means. That you have received life from the dead. That's why it's called born again. You were dead already. 
and you've received life from the dead. And no one could receive life from the dead until the first one came out of death. And his name is Jesus. The Bible says Jesus was the first begotten from the dead. And he heads up the new creation. So until Jesus resurrected, no one could be born again. And it means that that one who's come out of death has received eternal life into his spirit. And that eternal life was only made available by Jesus Christ. So all the others didn't have eternal life. They had a promissory note. God made a promise that when the Messiah came, they would have it. And that's why when Jesus went to Hades, when he went to hell, the Bible says he led captives in his train. He brought them out of hell. Now, their promise had been cashed. He brought them out of Abraham's bosom. You remember in the 27th chapter of the Matthew's Gospel, he tells us that many of the saints who slept came out of the graves after his resurrection. That means when Jesus came out of the grave, he was, he was the first to come out. He brought the others out. And people saw men and women who died years and years and years ago in the holy city. They were amazed to see them in Jerusalem. Can you imagine? Can you imagine seeing your grandfather of the fourth and fifth generation? You didn't even know his name. Now he shows up and suddenly you recognize him. To be your grandfather to the fourth generation. You recognize his face. Imagine if, imagine if Jacob showed up in your presence tonight. And you knew it was Jacob. That's the kind of thing that happened. And that little kid screamed. <laughs> and mommy said, what is it, what is it? He said, I just, <laughs> what is it? What is it? I saw Gideon. Gideon. <laughs> Says Gideon. Gideon? Which Gideon? Gideon. Gideon of all. They'll think he was crazy. And she went in to call the father. The father ran out. What is it, my boy? He says, I saw Gideon. Gideon. And while he's still arguing with his son, there's another one running down the street. He just saw someone else of another generation. I saw Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet. That's the kind of thing that happened in Jerusalem. There was holy commotion. And their testimonies were so astounding that they could not be denied. They saw them. And the Bible says they came out of their graves which means people went to the graveyards and saw the stones had been moved. There was proof. They didn't just come out spiritually. No, the Bible says they came out of their graves. You say, who opened those graves? Don't forget, at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, there had been an earthquake. The Bible says, aha, uh -huh, now you get it. He <laughs> says, and the rock split. They shook up the whole earth and got those stones cracked up. It was easy. There was a preparation. The Bible says they came out of their graves. Not just that they appeared. They came out of their graves. Man, oh man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you had your house built over somebody's grave, he showed up in your sitting room. <laughs> Think about that. My goodness. Imagine Elisha showing up in your sitting room. Because you built your house about this grave. 
The Son of God came out and I came out with him. Bye! And he's gone. So where, where are they all going? Glory to God. Amen. One of these days, brother. Amen. We are checking out of here. Amen. And it will not be long. Getting out of here. That's what this is all about. Getting set. Getting set. That's what this is all about. Our eyes are looking up to the Son of God who's coming again soon. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. And now you're ready. He's coming. Are you ready to meet him? The Bible says the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. It's going to happen. And that will not be the first time that someone was taken away from here alive. Enoch was taken away from this world alive. Elijah was taken away from here alive. Cut away from here alive. And finally, Jesus in another way. He wasn't cut away. He just went. Alive. And he says in the same manner that he left, He'll come back. He'll come back. While we're thinking about, we've received salvation. Christ is coming back for us. Oh, when he comes, we will go with him. Yeah. What about the guy who's not ready? What about your cousin who's not ready? What about your brother who's not ready? What about your sister who's not ready? What about your wife who's not ready? What about your husband who's not ready? What about your children who are not ready? What about your parents who are not ready? What about your friends? What about those with whom you work who are not ready? What about your neighbors who are not ready? I want to read something to you. Remember this. Revelation, book of Revelation, chapter 20. Let's read from verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Ten. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Now, the, the scripture we read, verse 9, is talking about how things are going to end up in this world. And the, the, the final battles that will be fought in how God's going to end up this whole stuff. But um, right after that, he shows us how they go in for this judgment. So judgment day will come. You say, how long from now? The many things to happen before that judgment day. The one that we're waiting for, which is the very next significant event for the church, is the rapture of the church. About every significant thing that God said will happen before the rapture has happened. Are you hearing me? There's one more thing. But he didn't tell us that that should be before the rapture. But it's going to be close to the rapture. And Bible indication is that the rapture, 
will take place before it. And that is the signing of the treaty with Israel. It is either the rapture takes place just before it, or when you hear the announcement, and we are not gone yet, get ready, because it will just be at the doors. Now you say, a treaty? You never heard about that. Well, they are working on it. They already have the draft. But I want, to, I want to read the more disturbing parts to you. I said disturbing because we can be talking about we're going to heaven, but I'm asking, what about all those others who are not ready? Aren't you going to do anything about it? Dear Lord Jesus. All right, back to verse 10. Put verse 10 again, Revelation chapter 20. Let's see how much we can take. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. So you can see Satan's future is clear. He's going to the lake of fire and he knows it. That's his future. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Where the beast and the false prophet are. He's talking about the Antichrist. The Antichrist will go to hell and the lake of fire. So that's his future. And the false prophet, well, that's another personality that worked with him, and shall be tormented day and night, forever and ever. You know, one guy said to me one time, I don't mind going to hell. I won't be the only one there. He said, all of us bad guys will be there and we'll just be enjoying ourselves. I said, let me tell you something. That's not the last point of call. It's not the last place. After that place, you're going to another place. He said, where is that? As it's called the lake of fire. He said, where? I read it to him. Lake of fire. I said, in that one, you can't see the next person because everything is fire. <laughs> you open your eye, fire. You open your mouth, fire. Everywhere is fire. You can't see the next guy. So there's no such thing as someone else is going to be singing and you're going to be dancing. There's no space between for something else. It's all fire. It's called the lake of fire. I said, if you're thrown into water and you open your mouth, what will enter? Water. You open your eyes, what will enter? Water. I said, in lake of fire, you open your mouth, fire. Eyes, fire. It's all fire. And there will be no day where God is going to say, finally, let's, let's bring them out. They have learned their lessons. No. The Bible says it's eternal damnation. <laughs> Listen. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We have been saved. Thank God, thank God. What about those who have not recognized the salvation that Christ brought? I read it to you today. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Let's keep reading. Put the scripture back there. And I saw a great white throne. This is the judgment throne. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. Can you imagine the throne shows up and the earth bounces back? But there's no place to go. The earth and the heaven skipped like rams. When the throne showed up, this is the awesomeness of God. You're talking about vibrations? No, they're skipping. That's what he tells you. And there was found no place for them. Verse 12. And I saw the dead, those who had died. He said, I saw the dead, small and great. Whether it was the peasant, he was there. Whether it was the Caesar or the Pharaoh, they were there. Look at that. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. I tell people, when you see things with us today, make no mistakes. Man hasn't created anything that he didn't see from God. God put these things in our minds. You talk about cars and, 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 and uh, 
airplanes today. Didn't you read the child of fire that took Elijah to heaven? God already had vehicles. He already had. This is not new. The books were open. Books in heaven? No wonder you got books. The books were open in heaven. I said, why do we make chairs? Because God has a throne. We just read it. He said, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. So it was a chair. You don't have anything that God didn't already have. Yours is just a caricature of the real. The Bible says he wore a robe. Now you can see why you're dressed. Somebody thought that when God made Adam and Eve, he put them there, you know, to be climbing like monkeys, and they had nothing to wear. But thank God they fell. They sinned against God. No wonder he gave them something. Come on. He always planned that they should have something to wear, but not through sin. There was a higher life plan for them. Let's read. When I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, in another book, Notice two sets. The books were open. Then another book. All right. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So everything that anybody ever did is in those books. There are books and books and books. And their works were written in those books. No one is going to lake a fire for something he did. You're going to see what will take someone to lake a fire. You see it in a moment. Hmm. Mm -hmm -hmm. Verse 13. And the sea gave up. So those who had perished in the sea, there was no hiding place. They came out. He said, what if the person was born to ashes? Come on, don't think stupidly. Even those who were buried nicely, didn't they decay? They decayed into the dust. And yet, the Bible says they came together. Didn't you see the valley of dry bones? Yeah. Where Ezekiel stood? He said, as I prophesied, bone came to its bone. He says, there was a noise and there was a shaking. Every bone found its own bone and joined together. And before long, they were covered with skin, muscle and skin, and they stood up. All right, let's go. He says, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell. When someone dies, who doesn't know God, who doesn't know Jesus, he goes straight to hell. You see that? He goes to hell. Hell is a waiting place. It's a place of torment, but it's still a waiting place. After hell, the judgment. Then lake of fire. Look at it. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. <laughs> and they were judged every man according to their works. You see, God is so, he, he doesn't want anyone to have this, uh, idea of, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know. All your works have been written. So first is to let you know what you did. Before he says, now let's see where you go. He says, they were judged according to their works. There's nothing you will ever do or say that will not get into God's book. Verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Hmm. Okay, verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever was not found. What happened? How does who, this book of life, whose name is there? And whose name is not there?
Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Whew. Turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 12. We are reading from verse 1. Hi. Oh, Lord Jesus. You know, I read the scriptures and I weep and I weep and I weep. And I think, Lord Jesus, how much more can we do? So much more. So much more. So much more. Look at this. And at that time shall Michael stand up, Michael the archangel. Now, the angel of the Lord is speaking to Daniel the prophet and giving him this wonderful revelation of the future. And says, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. That means that Michael stands for the children of Israel. Okay? And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. There it is again about that book. That book. Hmm. Verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth, those who have died, shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to, to shame and everlasting contempt. Oh God. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And I said, Lord Jesus, I'm one of them. I'm going to turn many to righteousness in the name of Jesus. Not they that turn some to righteousness. It says, they that turn many to righteousness. The Bible says, he that winneth souls is wise. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. What are you waiting for? This is serious. This is serious. There's no middle ground. Some to everlasting life, he says. That's verse 2. And he says, and some to what? Shame and everlasting contempt. If you love anyone, Preach the gospel to them. Preach the gospel. If you have to cry, preaching it to them, cry and preach it. Yes, weep for their souls. And if you find you are unable to weep for lost souls, start weeping that you could not weep. I'm serious. If your heart is so hardened that you were unable to weep for lost souls, be sorry for yourself and start weeping for yourself. Because if you don't weep today, you weep in the wrong place. I will show you now. I will show you now. Book of Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. This is, this is no game. It's no game. If it's a game, when they finish, you say, okay, let's start again. This is no game. This is for real. Ezekiel chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 17. He says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word. I I'm trying to show you God's way of thinking. Are you hearing me? Okay. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Verse 18, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at thine hand. You know the meaning of requiring his blood at your hand? That means he will ask for you in his place. Verse 19. Yet if thou warn the wicked 
and he turned not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. If you warn them, you have delivered your own soul. But if you don't, he says, that man will pay for his evil deeds. He says, but I'll require his blood from your hands. I couldn't keep quiet after reading, after reading this years ago. I couldn't keep quiet. No. I couldn't. I was going to preach to anybody and everybody. Because I don't want God to require the sinner's blood from my hands. You know, I, I remember that song, that old song the saints used to sing as they thought about the sinners. No, no, the sinner's voice you hear. Gone, gone, they have gone, they have gone, marching. To join the glorious ones. Oh no, had I know. The sinner that doesn't receive the gospel is only going to regret at the end. He says, No, no, the sinner's voice you hear. Gone, gone, they have gone, they have gone. Talking about us, marching. To join the glorious ones. No, no, had I known. Had I known, he'll say, I would have gone to church. Had I known, I would have believed the gospel. Had I known, I would have listened to my cousin. Had I known, had I known. But we've got to do something. We can't wait for that moment. We can't wait. Satan wants to see to it that he gets as many, as many, as many of God's creatures as he can into this destruction because he doesn't want to go to a lake of fire alone. He doesn't want to go alone. The Bible says it was prepared for the devil and his angels. He didn't say it was prepared for human beings. It was prepared. The lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. But they are going to drag others with them. Because they feel, they know, that that's the only way to touch the heart of God. So that's a painful moment for Jesus to see those for whom he died still going to hell. Even though he had done everything that should have been done. But we are his partners. That's why he's so keen on this thing. The Bible says the Lord working with them. The Lord working with them. They went for them, priests everywhere. The Lord working with them by the Holy Ghost. Working with them. Once you go out in his name, he will join you. The Lord working with them. Confirming the word. You're not going to be preaching alone. He'll be there to confirm the word. While you're talking on the outside, he'll be talking to them on the inside. That's why I said be filled with the Holy Ghost so that he can walk with you. You become his witnesses. Witnesses are proof producers. Saki mondo robo You know, there's a, there's a song we used to sing. Light your world. Let the love of God shine through you in the little things you do. Light your world. And though your light may be reaching only two or three, light your world. Light your world. Light up your world. In the little things you do. He says, and though your light may be touching only two or three, it doesn't matter. That's still good. The Bible says, for every one lost sinner that repents, there's joy in heaven. Everyone. Light your world. Light 
shine through you in the little things you do. It doesn't matter that your light can only reach two or three. Go ahead and light up your world. Let others see the light of Christ in you. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Don't take a bar about on the shalabah. They grow stay. Shalaman de Greta has this. Arunji frapti kous alahades, kira houska shalemagunda grida gabaustos strelions ko save rabadi lahante says. Remember, everywhere that God has placed you is your mission field. Everywhere you work is your mission field. Hallelujah. At this moment. I want you to pray because God is going to use you. God is going to use you. God is going to do big things with your life. Open your mouth and pray. When we hear the word, we've got to act on it. If you have not received salvation from Christ, you can do so right now by saying these words. Heavenly Father, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe He died for me. And I believe God raised Him from the dead. And He's alive today. I declare with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord of my life from this day and by my faith in his name I receive eternal life into my spirit thank you Lord for saving my soul I have eternal life now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ amen if you pray that prayer God heard you and answered you and salvation is yours now and that means you have received a new life. You have received eternal life. And that means you're born again. You have the new life of Christ. Congratulations. God bless you. If you just said.